really pleased that John is uh, opening this uh, season for us with this presentation today about religious freedom, a uh, subject that is quite dear to this community and is quite dear to this United States and has become much more controversial, it seems to me, in the last maybe 25 years than it probably was ever before this time, but he can fill us on that in on that. Um, I hope that you will come back. I hope that you will bring friends along with you in the future. Uh, it's always a little bit unpredictable about who will wend her way downtown, and here are a few more coming in. Uh, welcome. Well-timed. This is a series of presentations by our fellows in residence. Uh, today, John Regasta, as I just mentioned, is going to be talking about religious freedom. Uh, Jefferson, Madison, and Adams, who is not frequently included in that uh, triumvirate. But uh, we hope to have events like this. We will have events like this, uh, six or so a, uh, during the year and uh, in this place. And then we also have six or so at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, which is 145 Edenham Drive. It's in the Boar's Head Complex. Everybody in this room, except for one person, I'm sure has been there. Uh, and uh, so I know you can find your way. But it's a great pleasure to have John with us. He was a fellow with us previously and uh, has returned. He spent last year teaching at Hamilton College. He has also taught at Randolph, what is now Randolph College, the former randolph Megan Women's College. And he has taught uh, occasionally at the University of Virginia School of Law. He earned his doctorate in history here. He also earned his, doc his uh, JD, uh, Juris Doctor, at the University of Virginia as well. About 25 years ago, does that sound about right now? And practiced law for 20 years and decided that uh, he saw the light. Uh, the light of the academic world, the light of the humanities. So we're very pleased to have him here today. Thank you, Rob, and, and thank you to the Virginia Foundation. Um, you know, you have to be an academic, I think, to really appreciate how important it is to have places like VFH where you can go and study and read and, and learn. So it's a great privilege to be here. Um, let me t uh, say a little bit about how this talk came about because that really defined what I'm doing here to some extent. I'm actually speaking at Christopher Newport later this week at a symposium on religious toleration, the founders' perspectives. And as I was discussing that with the people running the symposium, they said, you know, what we'd really be interested in is conversations among the founders. Can you, you is something where there's back and forth. So I started thinking about this notion of conversations, which is really a very important one to us from a historic perspective. I mean, after all, with the founders, anyone can take a quote and you can say, well, the founder said this, or the founder said that. But when you get a conversation, uh, there's a little bit more context, a little bit more meaning to it. And so I was toying with this idea of uh, trying to look at conversations. Now, that's not always easy. Uh, Tom Jackson and I were discussing this the other day, and he said, well, you know, you get into the 20th century and you have letters, but what about the telephone conversations? And it's occurred to me for some time, I'm very thankful I'm not going to be around 100 years from now and be a historian of the 21st century, uh, dealing with tweets and text messages and emails and phone conversations. You won't have to worry about letters. Nobody writes those anymore. Um, but, you know, how do you get a full conversation in that kind of a world? Well, the conversations I'm looking at, we actually have fairly full conversations because we're dealing with people who are apart and we're seeing their letters. Now, we, there may have been conversations. Uh, Madison may have said to somebody, tell Tom such and so, but I think we have uh, fairly detailed conversations here. And I'm going to look at three in particular um, that I would like to talk about. The first is the conversation between Madison and Jefferson about the Bill of Rights after the Constitution is adopted and the question comes up, do we need a Bill of Rights? The second is the conversation, using the term a little broadly here, in the election of 1800 between Jefferson and Adams um, as that campaign goes on. And of course they're talking through surrogates in the election. And then the third conversation I want to talk about is uh, their retirement correspondence, how Jefferson and Adams in retirement talk to each other in these letters that we have preserved and, and what we can learn from that. Now, uh, 
all of this leads to a question for me and a question for you, uh, which is, can we learn something from these conversations? Is there something about a conversation that maybe gives us a more fulsome view of history? And since this is a conversation, uh, I certainly welcome questions from you. If you want to ask a question as I'm talking, it's not going to bother me. Please interrupt. Otherwise, we'll hopefully leave some time for questions at the end. So this first conversation, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison about the Bill of Rights. Um, we recall that it's the summer of 1787. Uh, Madison has spent the whole summer in Philadelphia working on the convention. Madison is exhausted, by the way, at the, by the end of the convention, because not only is he participating every day in the debates and taking notes, at night, when everybody else is out partying and enjoying themselves in an inn, Madison is back in his room copying down his notes from the day and expanding them, trying to record things. And he comes out at the end uh, very pleased with himself, very pleased with the Constitution. And uh, immediately the Constitution comes under attack, and they realize they're going to have a difficult time having it adopted. The attacks on the constitutions from the Anti-Federalists come basically in two areas. The first we would call states' rights, people saying, we don't want this big, powerful federal government with taxing authority. The other was a Bill of Rights. Almost immediately, people said, we need a Bill of Rights. Now, interestingly, Madison is initially opposed to a Bill of Rights. Uh, we think of Madison as the great proponent of the Bill of Rights, but he's initially opposed, and he's opposed for four reasons. He says, look, first of all, the federal government only has enumerated powers. So it has no power to interfere with press or religion uh, or you know, these other protections, protection for your homes. So we don't need a Bill of Rights. Second, um, he says, you know, these Bill of Rights, when we've had them in the states, when a majority comes along that wants to violate those rights, which he had seen in Virginia, uh, they do so. These are parchment barriers. A Bill of Rights doesn't do you any good if you have a corrupt government. Uh, third reason he's opposed is because he says, look, the states are really far more likely to interfere with people's rights than the federal government. We see that today, we could say. And finally, he realizes, he says, you know, if we have to have a Bill of Rights, if we have to do that first, it may interfere with ratification of the Constitution. So he's on record as being opposed. And he writes Jefferson on October 24th. Uh, Jefferson is in Paris. Jefferson's the ambassador. And, and Madison writes him telling him about this great constitution we have, and, and it's going to really save the republic. And he mentions in passing that at the end of the convention, George Mason had stood up from Virginia very late in the day. George Mason stands up and says, you know, the constitution is coming along. We need a bill of rights. And he's just shouted down. Everybody says, sit down, George. Uh, probably as much because of exhaustion as anything. They, they, they just had it. We're not going to have a Bill of Rights. And Madison mentions this only in passing when he writes to Jefferson. Well, Jefferson writes back. Jefferson writes back on uh, De December 20th. This is interesting because Madison's letter arrives on December 19th. Jefferson writes an extended letter back the next day. He doesn't normally do this with Madison. So he, he's very interested in this. And he has a short paragraph saying, well, the Constitution doesn't look too bad. And then he goes on and writes, I will now add what I do not like. First, the omission of a Bill of Rights, providing clearly and without aid of sophisms for freedom of religion. He says, let me add that a Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and what no just government should refuse or rest on inferences. Now, Madison, who's on record opposed to Bill of Rights, gets this letter, and <laughs> I'm very curious. I, you know, if you could go back and see things, I'd like to see Madison's reaction to Jefferson. Um, you know, we're not supposed to speculate as historians. I, I actually think speculation is okay as long as you're clear when you're speculating. I, I speculate, but I'm fairly confident that it was not unusual when Madison got a letter from Thomas Jefferson, as he read it, his first reaction, <laughs> Tom. <laughs> Because Madison is always trying to get things done. He's really very practical. He's actually much more of a lawyer than Jefferson. Technically, he's not trained in the law. And Jefferson always has these starry ideas and these visions, and, and, and Madison's just trying to get the Constitution adopted. So he gets this letter from Jefferson saying, we need a Bill of Rights. Um, now, Madison... Uh, goes back and forth with Jefferson. I won't go through all the details. Throughout the summer, 
By the end of the summer uh, of 1788, it's clear that the Constitution is going to be adopted. Finally, Virginia ratifies, New York ratifies, we're going to have a Constitution. And Madison now changes his tone. And he writes Jefferson um, late in 1788, and he says, my opinion has always been in favor of a Bill of Rights, provided it be so framed as not to imply powers not meant to be included in the enumeration of powers. Now, a lot of historians look at that and say Madison's being disingenuous. He's clearly opposed to a Bill of Rights. He's now in favor of Bill of Rights. Times have changed. We don't need to worry about the adoption of the Constitution now. The Constitution's been adopted. He's been getting pressure from constituents. He's getting pressure from Jefferson. And he says, I favor, I favor a Bill of Rights. And the conversation between them continues and gets a little more detailed. And I think from this conversation, we can hear two things. Uh, the first is, what did Jefferson and Madison think religious freedom meant? And the second is how they believed it would be enforced. So Madison um, had been talking about this during the Virginia ratification debates. And during the Virginia ratification, he had said, you know, everybody in the country understands that religious freedom means we can't pick one religion. We can't make the Presbyterians the national religion, the way it was in England, where the Anglican Church was the national religion. We can't make the Baptist the national religion. But a lot of people think that's all it means. Okay, and this is still being propounded today. Justice Thomas, Justice Scalia say that's all it means. Well, well, that has grave implications because if that's all it means, there's no separation of church and state. The government can support the church so long as they don't pick an individual church. The government can support religion so long as they don't support any individual religion. And Madison had been arguing about this in the Virginia ratification debates, and he had said everybody agrees with that. They're opposed to an exclusive establishment. But he goes on to explain what he and Jefferson mean by religious freedom. There is not a shadow of a right in the general government to intermeddle with religion. Its least interference with it, with it would be a most flagrant usurpation. Okay. This is separation of church and state. Government needs to stay out of religion. Um, but he writes to Jefferson and he says, look, uh, Tom, there's a problem. Everybody agrees that religious freedom means no exclusive establishment. You and I have this much richer vision. And he says, I am sure that the rights of conscience in particular, if submitted to public definition, would be narrowed much more than they are likely ever to be by an assumed power. Okay, so you, Tom, you and I have this very broad view, but if we, if we submit it to public opinion, if there's going to be a national referendum, um, it's going to be much narrower. It's going to look like this restriction on exclusive establishments, which after all was what Patrick Henry had been pushing. And so he says, Tom, you know, you want me to get a Bill of Rights, but we've got to be careful here. We need to move uh, very carefully and not, um, uh, not open this up to public debate. Now, Jefferson writes back. He says, look, half a loaf is better than no bread. If we cannot secure all our rights, let us secure what we can. Now, this is once again a letter that Madison gets and goes, <laughs> Jefferson's clearly wrong here. That if you open up the issue of religious freedom to, to debate, to national debate, and if what you get is half a loaf, that what the First Amendment says is Congress cannot choose a single national religion. Madison's view is that that's worse than nothing because we're, you know, we're going to be dealing with government promotion of religion. But Jefferson says, no, no, move ahead, get half a loaf, get what you can. So their goal, though, there's, there's clearly a recognition that um, we need a very expansive definition of religious liberty, uh, a recognition that we've got to be careful we don't get something more narrow. But Jefferson then in that same letter where he says a half a loaf is better than no bread, uh, he goes on to say to Madison, in the arguments in favor of a declaration of rights, you omit one which has great weight with me, the legal check which it puts in the hands of the judiciary. Uh, he goes on, should therefore, that, that a Bill of Rights should therefore guard us against their legislative and executive abuses of power within the field submitted to them. And Madison ends up embracing this. When Madison goes to the first federal Congress, he realizes that Jefferson has made a very fundamental observation. If we get a Bill of Rights, what we get is a court 
which can declare a law of Congress unconstitutional. Madison tells the first federal Congress that we need a Bill of Rights so that independent tribunals of justice will consider themselves in a peculiar manner the guardians of these rights. They will be an impenetrable bulwark against every assumption of power in the legislative or executive. So this conversation, and I've gone over it very quickly, this conversation I actually deal with in some length in, in my uh, book on religious freedom. Um, you know, it starts with Madison saying, we don't need a Bill of Rights. Jefferson says, we need a Bill of Rights. And then this discussion of how broad is it going to be, both of them saying it needs to be very broad. Madison saying, there's a danger here. We might get a narrower First Amendment. Uh, and Jefferson saying, we need it because it will give us a judiciary which will stand up for rights against legislative usurpation. So very interesting uh, exchange between them, and, and uh, you know, in my mind at least, tells us a little bit more about what was happening when Madison goes to the Congress uh, in the first Congress and seeks a Bill of Rights. Well, what about the second conversation? Maybe a little more interesting, maybe a little more timely, uh, the election of 1800. Now, we know, um, I think people are generally aware, the election of 1800 was very heated. Uh, the press was very violent at times. Uh, I always like 18th century insults. You know, it always strikes me they're much better at insulting than we are. Um, you know, today you just swear at somebody, and that, that demonstrates a lack of creativity to a large extent. Um, Jefferson was the real excellent insulter. I mean, my favorite is what he says about Patrick Henry. He refers to Patrick Henry as all tongue without either head or heart. Now, now that's an insult, you know. You don't have to swear. You, you, you say these things. So, but the election of 1800 is, is bound up in these kinds of insults back and forth between Jefferson and Adams, and that, through surrogates, come back to that, through surrogates, um, and religion is center to the insults. Religion becomes, and religious freedom becomes very central to the insults. Um, what kinds of things are we talking about? Yale, the president of Yale, Timothy, Dry, uh, Timothy Dwight, writes that if the Republicans, if Jefferson comes to power, we may behold a strumpet personating a goddess on the altars of Jehovah. The Bible will be cast into a bonfire, the vessels of the sacramental supper, borne by an ass in public procession, and our children, either wheedled or terrified, uniting and chanting mockeries against God. Pretty serious. Now, a uh, Federalist newspaper, the Connecticut Current, and most of this is targeted at Jefferson, the Connecticut Current writes, and, and listen to this list, by the way. It's fascinating for the Federalists as to what's important. Notice what they, how they list things in order of importance. Uh, if Jefferson is elected, look at your houses, your parents, your wives, and your children. Okay, property is most important, and then your parents, your ancestors, your wife, and your children. Uh, look to your property, your parents, your wives, and your children. Are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames, hoary hairs bathed in blood, female chastity violated, or children writhing on the pike and halberd? I'm taking this fairly seriously. Uh, the Jacobins are ravening wolves, preparing to enter your peaceful fold and glut his deadly appetite on the vitals of your country. Uh, the Gazette of the United States, perhaps most famously, writes, Shall I continue in allegiance to God, any religious presidents, or impiously declare for Jefferson and no God? Um, now, pause for a moment. I mean, two sub-points. The first, as I mentioned, this is surrogates. This is not Adams and Jefferson directly. Uh, Adams, in particular, continues to defend Jefferson um, through the election of 1800 and angers Alexander Hamilton no end uh, and his cabinet, who are all Hamiltonians, uh, that in cabinet meetings, as they're attacking Jefferson, they're trying to lay out a, a political campaign. Adams will say, "That's you know, you're not being fair to Jefferson. Um, Accordingly, this is a quote from um, Fisher Ames, accordingly he, Adams, respects his rival. His irreligion, wild philosophy, and Jim Crackery in politics are never mentioned. Uh, so Adams is not personally attacking Jefferson, and Jefferson is not personally attacking Adams. Of course, that's going to become important when they reconcile later. Second um, sort of sub-point or aside, um, the election of 1800 is often held up by comparison to today's elections. And when we see the violent elections today, things said today, we're seeing it um, this week, uh, people say, well, it's always been that way. People have always reacted that way. Um, 
I'm not sure that that's a fair comparison. I think that it's much more complicated than that. For one thing, we really didn't have gerrymandering uh, the way we have now, that the the nature of the impact of that kind of violent uh, statement may have been very different. But let's set those aside for a moment and talk a little bit about this conversation that I want to look at. So the Federalists are saying terrible things about Jefferson and his religion. What do the Republicans say back? And they comment in two particular areas, and that's, this is what's of interest to me. The, the first thing that they say is, you know, Jefferson's not really so irreligious. And of course, given Jefferson's views on religion, they have to engage in a little misdirection here. They're, they're very careful about how they characterize his religion. Um, one Republican writes back that Jefferson, you know, this is really good. You have to read these very carefully. Uh, Jefferson is at least as good a Christian as Mr. Adams and in all probability, a much better one. Well, knowing what we know about Adams' religion, that doesn't necessarily say a lot. To say he's at least a good Christian, Mr. Adams. Uh, DeWitt Clinton in New York, trying to defend Jefferson, um, says, look, there are many different Christian sects in, in uh, America, quote, all agreeing in the divinity of the religion of Christ. Okay, not in the divinity of Christ, in the divinity of the religion of Christ. Je Jefferson does not believe in the divinity of Christ. He, he rejects the divinity of Christ. So very carefully trying to parse uh, Jefferson's religious views. That's not the primary response. What's interesting is that while there are Republicans who defend Jefferson's religiosity, there are far more Republican newspapers and Republicans who attack the Federalists on grounds of religious freedom. Charles O'Brien, a modern historian, says, for the most part, Republican propagandists fought back by making the union of mitre and scepter an issue in itself. Um, the Republicans preferred to take the ground, the only one Jefferson would approve, that the entire question was irrelevant. So the Aurora, the Philadelphia Aurora, the most famous Republican newspaper at the time, uh, publishes this. Uh, the choice is between supporters of an established church um, and those not, and whether or not we would separate church and state. Uh, the Aurora writes later, uh, we have a clear choice between religious liberty, the rights of conscience, no priesthood, truth, and Jefferson versus an established church, a religious test, and an order of priesthood. Now, this is curious. Uh, the Federalists are attacking Jefferson as being irreligious, and they're attacking, attacking him for his religious views, and the primary Republican response is to say, this is an issue of separation of church and state. Um, and they thought that that was a winning strategy, and it was. They win the election, and now we can say there's a lot of things going on in this election, of course, but how significant was this issue? Well, John Adams writes later, that this is why he lost the election, uh, that he was associated with the notion that religion was going to be affiliated with the government. Jefferson was associated with separation of church and state. Uh, Adams writes, uh, now this is several years later, it's in 1812, uh, but the secret whisper ran through them, all of the various sects, uh, let us have Jefferson, Madison, Burr, or anybody, whether they be a philosopher, deist, or even atheist, rather than a Presbyterian president, because he was associated with the He's not Presbyterian, but he was associated with the Presbyterians. So curious conversation. We're going to attack somebody based on religion, and the response, rather than defending Jefferson's religion primarily, there is some of that, is to say, no, um, this is an issue of separation of church and state. And apparently at the time, if, if Adams is to be believed, um, the issue of religious freedom is becoming so significant that it actually carries weight um, in, in, the, um, in the national election. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you have a Bill of Rights. Um, the answer is a good point. You, you have the Bill of Rights. Uh, we have the First Amendment saying there shall be no establishment. But, you know, this is still being worked out at the time. What, what Adams had done specifically that got people concerned was he had issued a prayer proclamation and said that, you know, we're having this crisis with France. Uh, we all need to come together in prayer. The prayer proclamation sounded very Presbyterian. It's very Calvinist. 
Um, and, and he says, look, the people are associating me with the idea that the government's going to intervene in religion, and rightfully so. He had done this. Jefferson refuses to, write, to do um, prayer proclamations as president. Washington had done prayer proclamations. Uh, Adams does prayer proclamations. Jefferson refuses. Um, and so that's what that's what they're referring to, that uh, Adams had come out shortly before the election with this prayer proclamation about the dispute with France. And the uh, Republicans, rather than defending Jefferson's religiosity, attack Adams as engaging in church and state, the cooperation between church and state. So, so it seems to me it's a fairly interesting conversation. That's an interesting political response, and as I say, one, one that, that works out. Well, let, let me mention um, finally and briefly a third conversation, this time between Adams and Jefferson directly in their correspondence after 1812. They're brought back together, uh, we, we recall, by Benjamin Rush in 1812. You know, there's a little bit of kabuki dance going on as to who's going to write who first and, and why. Uh, Jefferson and Adams know what's going on. They know this is a reconciliation. Uh, but they begin this correspondence that many people are familiar with. Um, they write scores of letters. One of the things I did in September, I was talking earlier about the uh, value of being at a place like the Virginia Foundation, I sat down and read the Jefferson and Adams letters from cover to cover. Fascinating reading. I mean, to read all of those letters, one after, we, we see bits and pieces being picked out of them, but it's a, it's a remarkable um, uh, set of documents. And again, something which we don't have anymore. We don't write letters like this. Well, religion and religious freedom are a very central part of those letters back and forth. Uh, there's probably been more done with their religion in these letters, and one has to be careful in reading these letters, especially when uh, talking about religion. They are, after all, private correspondence between very dear friends. Um, they they uh, joke with each other about religion. Uh, at one point, Adams asked Jefferson about an um, Indian prophet. This was the Tenskwatawa. Uh, the Indian prophets are beginning to make headway in the old northwest Ohio and Indian and Illinois, and, and Adams asked Jefferson about it. And Jefferson writes back, uh, actually quoting the Bible, um, and says, Every man that is mad and maketh himself a prophet, thou shouldest put him in prison and in the stocks. Um, and Adams writes back and says, You know, I, I, I know you know a lot more than I do about a lot of things, but you quoting the Bible to me, that's, you know, something I didn't expect. And he said, I had to go look look it up, and you're right, that Bible does it. Well, you know, Jefferson doesn't really want to put the Indian prophets in stocks. This is friends going back and forth. Uh, we see similar... Um, issues, and, and maybe more important, when Abigail dies, um, Jefferson and Adams end up in a very uh, a, a very beautiful discussion of religion and their own beliefs, and, and Jefferson trying to reassure Adams that we will see her again soon, we, we will be reunited with the loved ones that we've lost. Um, important when we study Jefferson's religion, a lot of people ask, does he believe in life after death, does he believe in heaven? Difficult to say, and, and I think that one, if you take a letter, a personal letter after Abigail's death between Jefferson and Adams to say, well, see, he, he believes in life after death, or is he just reassuring an old friend? So we have, to, we have to read these letters with great care. But they do also have a conversation about religious freedom, which is fairly interesting. Um, starting very early on in uh, 1813, they, they begin correspondence in 1812. In 1813, um, Jefferson writes to Adams, um, and Jefferson is concerned. Adams has been embarrassed by the publication of some of Jefferson's old letters. Uh, Jefferson's old letters are starting to be published in the press. And Jefferson had written Joseph Priestley back in 1801 about the election of 1800. And he says, the barbarians really flattered themselves that they should even be able to bring back the time of vandalism when ignorance put everything into the hands of power and priestcraft. Okay, well, this is Adams' Federalist uh, were barbarians. Um, those letters from Priestley or to Priestley, Jefferson also talks about Jesus and asks Priestley to do a comparison between Jesus and the ancient philosophers. Um, and Jefferson says Jesus, his character, Jesus' character and doctrines have received still greater injury from those who pretend to be his special disciples. So again, attacking the priest, the priesthood, which Jefferson commonly was doing. Um, but Jefferson is trying to justify himself from this first letter. He knows Adams has read it. It's an embarrassment to him as they're just beginning their correspondence again, and he's referring to the Adams administration as barbarians. Um, so Jefferson says, they, 
the people who publish these kinds of letters, wish to be believed that they can have no religion who advocates its freedom, that all I was really interested in was religious freedom. Adams writes back and sort of says, not to worry, Tom, uh, in so many words, um, says, it is very true that the denunciations of the priesthood are fulminated against every advocate for complete freedom of religion. Combinations, I believe, would be plenteously pronounced by even the most liberal of them against atheism, deism, against every man who disbelieved or doubted the resurrection of Jesus or the miracles of the New Testament. Now, okay, what, what's, what's happening here? Let's take that apart a little bit. Um, Jefferson writes and says, look, people are beginning to attack religious freedom in, in the guise of defending religion. And Adams writes back and says, you're absolutely right. Don't be nervous. I'm on your side. Religious freedom applies to atheism, deism, even those who question the tenets of the New and Old Testament. Now, this is important. You recall we were talking about that, how the First Amendment is not simply about one religion, Justice Thomas, Justice Scalia. No, it's okay for the United States to be a Christian nation. It's okay to promote religion. We just can't pick one. Well, no, here's Adams and Jefferson back and forth talking about, no, it's about atheism, it's about deism, it's about those who deny the divinity of Christ. And they continue this conversation specifically in the context of electoral politics. Um, after Connecticut uh, is one of the last states that goes from Federalist to Republican, uh, Connecticut is also one of the last states to have an established church. Uh, when the Republicans finally win in Connecticut in 1816, and they do then modify the Connecticut Constitution to impose basically a separation of church and state, Adams writes to Jefferson, I congratulate you on the late election in Connecticut. Uh, Jefferson writes back and says, well, yeah, but Massachusetts, Massachusetts still has an established religion through 1833. And so Jefferson writes back and says, well, we've got to wait till Massachusetts gets its act together. Uh, he says, Massachusetts is still hanging on our hopes for what need we despair of after the resurrection of Connecticut to light and liberality. I had believed that the last retreat of monkish darkness, bigotry, and abhorrence of those advances of the mind, which had carried the other states a century ahead of them, I join you, therefore, in sincere congratulations that this den of priesthood is at length broken up and that a Protestant popedom, popedom is no longer a disgrace to the American history and character. Adams, so, so, you know, Connecticut has, has changed. Connecticut is going to eliminate its uh, provisions for an established church. Jefferson says, well, I thought Connecticut was going to be the last bastion. We still have to deal with Massachusetts. Adams writes back, Oh, Lord, do you think that a Protestant pope then is annihilated in America? Do you recollect or have you ever attended to the ecclesiastical strifes in Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York, and every part of New England? What a mercy it is that these people cannot whip and crop and pillory and roast as yet in the United States. If they could, they would. And finally, um, in 1825, and this, this conversation goes back and forth about the, these states, which are slowly being brought out of established churches, uh, you know, there's this continued threat of persecution. Um, Adams writes in 1825, you will recall that both Jefferson and Adams die in 1826 on July 4th, fortuitously, uh, so a year before their death, um, Adams and Jefferson are very concerned about this question, because what's happening? This is the period of the Great Awakening in America. You know, this is, this is you know, Protestantism is expanding dramatically, uh, which Jefferson is not opposed to. He's surprised by, he's not opposed to, but he wants to make sure that that doesn't become an interference between state and church. And Adams agrees. Uh, Adams writes, we think ourselves possessed, or at least we boast, that we are so of liberty of conscience, uh, conscience on all subjects and of the right of free inquiry and private judgment in all cases. And yet how far are we from these exalted privileges in fact? There exists, I believe, throughout the whole Christian world a law which makes it blasphemy to deny or to doubt the divine inspiration of all the books of the Old and New Testament from Genesis to Revelations. I think such laws a great embarrassment. Well, that's enough for that conversation as well. Um, so I started out looking at this question of religious freedom and wanting to explore it a little bit by looking at conversations between the founders 
and seeing whether in the conversation, in the back and forth, there was something we can learn. Um, and, and what do we take from all that? And again, I'll be interested in your comments. What do I take from all that, perhaps? Uh, first, I think the methodology is interesting. I think that, you know, we always, as historians, we talk about context. Context is important, uh, obviously. I think a conversation is a very useful context because we get that back and forth. We, we can understand things in uh, the nature of what they're saying. Uh, what do we take from it in terms of the substance of religious freedom in this era? Uh, well, one point, and again, the, there are members of the Supreme Court who question this, is that religious freedom, and in particular separation of church and state, was very important. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't something, that, a phrase that, you know, as um, uh, James Hudson from the Library of Congress basically says, the 1801 Danbury Baptist letter where Jefferson talks about a wall of separation between church and state. Was, it was just a little political document. It was an accident. It was just a phrase he came up with. It's not just a phrase he came up with. It's at the heart of this conversation between Jefferson and Madison about what should we do with the Bill of Rights. It it's got to be broader than just saying we can't have a national church and we need the courts to protect it. It's at the heart of the election of 1800. We're going to argue about religion, and the Republicans turn that on its head and say, well, what we ought to be talking about is church and state. And it's the heart of Jefferson and Adams' understanding of the developments that are happening in the uh, 1810s and 1820s as the states become increasingly Republican, that one of the critical things about those elections is they're going to move the states away from the established, uh, the established churches. After all, we, you know, we tend to uh, think about the First Amendment. You know, Nancy asks about the First Amendment. It's adopted in 1791, but that wasn't the end of uh, the discussion. Um, in fact, I was just um, I'm one of the uh, historians in a brief that was just filed with the Supreme Court in the Town of Greece case. Town of Greece, um, it's one of these small towns in New York where they open up the town meetings with a prayer, and it's been challenged. It's going to the Supreme Court. Uh, and there are a group of historians, uh, myself included, who filed an amicus brief. And one of the points we make is that, look, this period is not clean. Um, there are a lot of things that are happening. There are a lot of things that are being said that what's important is the progression of how things develop. What's important is the conversation. So, for example, we point out in our brief, and this actually was excellent work done by Michael Meyerson at the University of Baltimore School of Law. I don't think anyone else has ever looked at this issue. Um, he looks at what is said in court proceedings in the new government, in the new United States under the Constitution. We know now that when the Supreme Court comes in, uh, all rise, God save this honorable court. Okay. Well, before God saved this honorable court, a lot of those court proceedings were opened with detailed prayers. A minister would come in before the court proceeding and he would give a very sectarian prayer. It's John Marshall who changes that. Jefferson's great antagonist, John Marshall, who says, you know, maybe we ought to just say God save this honorable court. And it's the progression from starting with a very sectarian prayer, moving it toward a, uh, a much more generic, a much more inclusive prayer, which is sort of interesting in, in that discussion. To me, that's what's interesting about these conversations, is the progression of how they move. Um, so with that, I'll be interested in, in hearing some conversation from you about religious freedom. Thank you. If you want to ask a question, you will need to speak into the mic because we are recorded, and there is a remarkably large television audience for these programs, remarkable, all over the United States, maybe beyond. So I invite to questions, but I also ask that you use the microphone, which is the little tiny white dot right there. <laughs> Mine is very minor. I'm curious how these men addressed each other. Was it my dear friend? Hey, Tom. Jim, what do you think about this? And was there a in the way in these salutations over time you know it's a good question Jerry um, I have not looked at it in detail although my recollection and reading the letters they're always very formal my dear friend uh, my dear John my dear Tom um, I know that it is said um, that Jefferson in person referred to James Madison as Jimmy <laughs> 
And I remember seeing a presentation about a year and a half ago where the person doing the presentation kept referring to James Madison as Jimmy, and I found that offensive. You don't know him that well, okay? Uh, you can call him Mr. Madison, President Madison, James Madison. Um, so, uh, but letters were a form of art. He doesn't say Jimmy in his letters, but my understanding is that, that personally he would be much more colloquial with him. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm curious if anyone saw, there was an article in the New York Times, I think it was yesterday, about the chaplain of the Senate. Did anybody see that? So I didn't know there was a chaplain of the Senate, mm -hmm. but apparently recently he's been giving these very elaborate prayers to open the U.S. Senate proceedings and saying things like, forgive us for our arrogance, and, and really <laughs> saying these things, trying to get people to realize that you know, they need to talk to each other. And so I didn't know that was allowed. I didn't know that we had that. And so I guess what I'm struck by in your talk is how rational everyone seems. And everyone now seems way crazier. And I'm just wondering if you could sort of put that into some kind of historical perspective. I mean, what is going on now? And, and what do you take from what you're fi finding with these much more sort of considered, calmer, letters back and forth than, than maybe what we see today? Yeah. Uh, Faulkner's very good question. I mean, um, you say they're more rational to, uh, back then, but keep in mind this 1800 election where, you know, children writhing on the pike and halberd. I mean, uh, they, could, they could sling it pretty good. Um, in terms of the Senate chaplain, the, the chaplain started in uh, 1789. And people will often point out Madison was on the committee that approved the first chaplain. He did not personally approve the first chaplain. In fact, he, he makes it clear later he thinks the chaplain's a violation of the Constitution, that the Constitution says no establishment. Uh, he thinks a chaplain is a violation of that. Um, we actually take this on in this brief that I, I just mentioned and said, you know, um, while we've had chaplains, and it was upheld by the Supreme Court in Marsh, uh, the Marsh case in the 1780s, I believe, um, that you can have a congressional chaplain, you can have a legislative chaplain, their understanding of that chaplain was somebody who was, there being the, the founders, was somebody who was administering to their own um, uh, faith needs. Um, and that that's different from somebody who's going to stand up and make a public proclamation. Well, what's the difference? Madison says, you know, we may need chaplains in the Army and in the Navy. Okay, well, that starts to make much more sense. If I'm a naval chaplain and, and the guns are booming and some young man's about to die, or young woman today is about to die, that person can make a sectarian prayer. That person can make a prayer to Allah. That person can make a prayer, a Jewish prayer or a Presbyterian prayer, about, obviously, for that, that serviceman uh, who is seeking religious comfort. Um, what we suggest in the brief is their understanding of legislative prayer was very similar. They're all gathering in Washington. They're away from their homes. It's weeks to get back home, perhaps. They're going to be here for a long period of time. And the legislative chaplain was really a chaplain to the members. Now, again, Madison still thought that was unconstitutional. He thought his attitude was, you ought to pay for your own chaplain. You know, if the congressman want to pass around the hat and hire somebody, that's their business, but you shouldn't have a government-paid chaplain. Uh, but the Supreme Court has said that's it's okay to have a government-paid chaplain. Um, but historically, those chaplains have issued, and again, you go back hundreds of years, fairly non-sectarian. Great God, be with us as we gather today. Uh, and I have seen a little bit of what the Senate chaplains come out. He's getting a little more fiery. Um, uh, you know, how would they view that? As, as some, many of them, as I said, there's a progression. Many of them would have no problem with that because many of them didn't think separation of church and state, many of the founders didn't think separation of church and state was that critical. Madison and Jefferson uh, would have had a concern with that. And later, in his later life, Adams. I mean, as I said, we, we're also seeing a progression here for Adams uh, where he begins to think it's far more important. Um, I think you may have just answered my question, but there are two things here, separation of church and state and freedom of religion, and I wondered if people had ever argued on a more local level for a local religion based on that we have the right to decide, and if the majority of somebody decides 
Yeah. That we are going to be a Presbyterian town or something. I don't know. Has that ever? Happened? Oh, absolutely. I mean, keep, keep in mind when the when the First Amendment is adopted. I mean, it's a very good point, Nancy. That the the First Amendment applies only to the federal government. The Bill of Rights only applies to the federal government. It doesn't apply to the states at all. Which is why you have an established church in Massachusetts through 1833. You have an established church in Connecticut through 1817. You have. Um, uh, oath provisions. In, in 12 of the 13 states, when the First Amendment is adopted, all except Virginia, in 12 of the 13 states, you either have an established religion or an oath or test requirement, that if you want to be a member of the legislature, you have to be a Christian, you have to take an oath uh, about the inerrancy of the Old and New Testament, for example. Well, how do they do this? Well, that's this is exactly why, and again, I talk about this at some length in, in the book, uh, in the debates in Congress, when Madison introduces the First Amendment, um, some members stand up and say, well, wait a minute, in Connecticut, a member from Connecticut says, we still have an established religion. We don't want a provision which is going to interfere with what we do in our state. Representative from New Hampshire stands up and says, Congress shall make no law, the language we have now. Congress shall make no law. This only applies to the Congress. It only applies to the federal government. We have separation of church and state at the federal level. The states can do whatever they want. They can establish a church. They can have um, a, a state religion, which they still have in Connecticut. When does that change? Well, that's a little thing called the Civil War. I mean, after the Civil War is when you, um, and, and the Supreme Court starts to take cognizance of this in the 1940s. Uh, it's because of the Civil War that the First Amendment, and, and by the way, it's not just the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, people, people complain, people. Conservative justices complain. States were supposed to be allowed to have established religions. Uh, North Carolina, the other day, uh, somebody in North Carolina, a politician, stood up and said, uh, we can establish a church. There's nothing that says we can't establish a church. Well, yeah, the Civil War says you can't establish a church because the Bill of Rights is going to apply to you. That also includes the Second Amendment. So a couple of years ago when Chicago banned uh, handguns, the Supreme Court says uh, they could have done that before the Civil War. The, Second Amendment doesn't apply to Illinois or to Chicago. And the Supreme Court says, no, the, the Bill of Rights applies. So, Thanks, uh, John. Fascinating talk. Um, I'm interested. I'm sorry? Closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Great talk. Um, I'm interested, you know, a little more, too, in the institutional context. I always notice there's a perennial tendency in American party politics to be apocalyptic. You know, if the other side wins, it's the end of liberty. And I just heard somebody denouncing Obamacare on the radio that it's really the end of health care. Um, and uh, so uh, you've got uh, party politics tending to push uh, fears about what might happen mm -hmm. kind of to the extremes and that both sides are, are playing it. But what's really happening in terms of the Federalists and their alliance with particular churches? I mean, w were those fears grounded in any way? It's, you know, when you follow the money, who uh, stands to benefit, right? And how are they going to treat people? I mean, you're not going to have the degree to which the Puritans, you know, imprisoned people for non-attendance in church uh, anymore. So, uh, right. you know, on the ground, uh, we we know party politics tends to you know, make these exaggerate. Make these, yeah. But but there was a real kind of power struggle, and and maybe in Virginia, also in Connecticut, about you know just how much power and government resources and whatever authority these ecclesiastical types are going to have. Um, and I wonder uh, what the context was and how this this. Uh, Bill of Rights changed it. Um, yeah, I, I think they're very focused on that, Tom. I mean, you know, Michelle Bachman said yesterday, these are the end times. We, we really are to the apocalypse. Um, well, we should set that aside. Uh, party politics. I, I, I think Madison is really on to the key point. Um, and and I, again, I apologize, it's fairly detailed, um, walking through what was happening in the Virginia Convention and then in his uh, letters to Jefferson. If you go back a little earlier, in 1784 and 1785, uh, Patrick Henry had tried to get adopted in Virginia a general assessment. And what this was going to be was a tax on everybody. Everybody pays a tax to support religion. But then you get to specify, where, where do you want your tax to go? Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, you tell us, and we'll, that's who we'll give you. And, and this is fair, right? This is fair. 
Madison opposes this. Jefferson opposes this because no, government's not supposed to be interfering with religion. It's, it's for their perspective, government religion is an oxymoron. Um, so when he talks in the Virginia Convention and he says everybody, and, he, and, he, and by now he means everybody, he means even Massachusetts Federalists, even Connecticut Federalists, would agree that we shouldn't have a single national religion, Presbyterianism, Methodism. But, Tom, you and I have this much broader vision, and I'm not clear we can get this. And, and to your question of, you know, how serious was the real dispute, I think that's really where the dispute lay in um, the early 19th century. Because Connecticut and Massachusetts, even though they still had established religions, they were slowly modifying. In Massachusetts, it had been the Congregationalists. Well, if you got your Baptist church together, we'll allow you to collect taxes to support your Baptist minister. And Connecticut was moving in the same direction. Um, but this, I, I don't want to minimize the significance of this, because if you think about this in today's terms, uh, if that was the debate, separation of church and state and a Jeffersonian and Madisonian notion versus it's okay for the state to support religion and, in fact, to impose taxes to support religion, so long as you just don't pick one. Uh, and then the question becomes, well, what about, could it be just Christian religion, which is what Patrick Henry said? So, you know, Jews, Islam, atheists, all of that's going to be, you know, Hindus, all that's going to be pushed aside. Um, I think that 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 was a real risk, that the Federalists um, in Connecticut and in Massachusetts, especially uh, New Hampshire, uh, but you also had laws like that in uh, South Carolina. At the time the, the First Amendment's adopted, South Carolina, Maryland, New, New Jersey, um, it's okay to support religion as long as we don't pick. So I think that's where they were really going to come down to. John, with respect to the issue of the separation of church and state, would you be willing to speculate on a conversation between Jefferson and Scalia? <laughs> what about? Uh, I, <laughs> um, Scalia spoke here at UVA last week, and I unfortunately found out about that afterwards. I would have really liked to have gone and, and seen um, his presentation. And I'll actually defend Scalia a little, which is not normally my mode on these things. Um, he pointed out, he was asked the question about, what about Jefferson? You're at Mr. Jefferson's university. What about separation of church and state? And he pointed out that, uh, look, Jefferson is a very strong theist, which he is. Jefferson, he, he's not a Christian. And, and you see people today, David Barton says, you know, he was a Christian. He's not a Christian by any normal sense of the term. But he is a strong believer in God. He is a strict believer in separation of church and state. Uh, and I think Scalia would say, I can agree with that. But what Scalia's point he was making was that Jefferson never sought to purge the public square of religion. And I think that's true. And, and Scalia's complaint is that some of the people, um, we would say on the left today, go so far as to say, well, there should be no discussion of religion in the public square. And Jefferson certainly would have never, uh, never agreed with that. In fact, Jefferson recognized. Now, he thought it was all going to be Unitarianism. He says that the whole world will be Unitarian once they figure it out. Uh, it hasn't happened that way. Um, uh, where I think Scalia and Jefferson would disagree is this point that Tom raises, because Scalia is, is of the view, he has said in opinions, uh, Justice Thomas has said in opinions, that all the First Amendment means is you can't pick one religion or another. And I think Jefferson, in, in no uncertain terms, um, you know, look at, the, look at the language in the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, probably some of the most beautiful language Jefferson's ever drafted. Uh, no man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship, place, or ministry whatsoever, nor shall otherwise suffer on account of his religious opinions or belief, and that the same shall in no wise diminish, enlarge, or affect their civil capacities. This is separation of church and state. Um, and I think Jefferson would have some strong words uh, for Justice Scalia in that area. But, but, but Scalia, you know, fair enough. Jefferson is a strong theist. And uh, as long as it was private words, I hate to go on this, give you a specific example. And I've actually, I know I'm going to be having an argument about this on Thursday at this conference. Jefferson pointedly refuses to issue prayer proclamations, these official prayer proclamations. Washington had done it. Adams had done it. 
Jefferson is asked to do so as the British are impressing U.S. seamen in what leads up to the War of 1812. And a minister writes him a letter saying, we're in a national crisis. Why don't you issue a prayer proclamation? And Jefferson writes back and says, because it's a violation of the Constitution and because it's a very bad idea to have government telling us when to pray. Ministers should tell us not when to pray, not government. So he issues this very detailed uh, statement. In both of Jefferson's inaugural addresses, he prays. At the end of his inaugural addresses, he invokes God, he invokes heaven. Now, some people, Daniel Dreisbeck, who's on the panel with me on Monday, a professor at American University, says, well, Jefferson's just confused, obviously. There's no distinction in those two things. Well, I actually think Jefferson was rarely confused when it came to church and state. For him, and Madison talks about this expressly, which gives, us, gives me greater confidence in making this distinction, the one is an official proclamation I, Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States, on White House letterhead, issue a proclamation calling the people to prayer. That's a violation of the Constitution. I, Thomas Jefferson, saying what I think in my own personal inaugural address, have a prayer, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, and he does it. Now, you know, there's going to obviously be some very hard cases to, to distinguish there. Uh, Justice Scalia doesn't seem to see the distinction between those two things. Jefferson clearly did. Thank you very much. This was quite a treat. I like the conversation. I think it works well. And so I, I hope that uh, Christopher Newport agrees, uh, <laughs> along with the rest of us here today. And I want to mention that about 24 years ago, the Virginia Foundation, with Jesse Ball DuPont Funds, supported a film called The Supreme Court's Holy Battles, which was hosted and moderated by Roger Mudd. It's a really pretty interesting film. It's still out there, still available, and it gets at this whole issue of the church state. And as part of that, the group in Richmond uh, was founded at that same time for the separation of church and state, uh, First Freedom First Freedoms, yeah. Center. And they are still doing uh, an annual essay contest for high school students all over the country. Uh, I've been a judge for probably 20 years, and it's an absolutely fascinating way that the kids respond to these things. You would be astonished in a very pleasant way. So thank you all very much. There is a parking stamp up here. Uh, you're welcome to find it on your way out, and I hope you will return in weeks to come.